Hey everybody, this is Brad Dyke. Doing my second video for the week. Um, this video is about, uh, it actually correlates to my project for building out the Dell R730DX platform chassis. First starting out with an empty case housing, and then looking for a motherboard, looking for the next part, looking for the next part, and so on, and so on. Now, this is not for the faint of heart, I won't lie to you. Uh, OEM manufacturers and building OEM manufacturer server platforms is something of a trick because it's not the same thing as you just going out and picking a, a case that you like, putting a, you know, an i7 motherboard or something like that in there using a standard industry motherboard, kind of like this one. Taking this guy and putting him in, the, in this chassis and making yourself you know a home built server which is which is perfectly fine and a lot of people who are beginning to mid-tier do that quite a bit to meet their needs but it never fits correctly and there's some value in OEM manufacturing that's like Dell, HP and so on because those engineers have learned a few things so what if you could do both and that's the trick here so the very first thing you want to do is you want to do your research. Unlike, well, actually, like my compadres out there, three of them I can think of are off the top of the back, who just released videos on the uh, Dell R730 chassis, both the R series and the DX series, did pretty good reviews. I was really impressed with them. And, uh, of course, Rust Buckets is great, too. They always do a great job. Proud of those guys. Uh, they get access to equipment sooner than most of us because um, they're part of the how do you resell old gear group. But in my case, I didn't want a chassis to inherit because when you do, there's a good 60% chance that there was a reason why they got rid of the chassis in the first place, which means inherited problems. What if you could do the best of both worlds? What if you could build your white box, but you're building it with OEM equipment, which means you're building the equipment that was sold six or seven years ago with the spare parts they were putting out on the market today that were there a long time ago to support the warranty way back when, which means you have an adequate supply of all the parts and pieces you need to take an empty chassis like a 730 chassis and fill it up. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I might, if you please look at the other video I made about you know me deciding to build from the ground up a 730 chassis, uh, you'll see an empty chassis that evolves into a for, for the most part, fully populated chassis with all the parts and pieces and knit cards and all that good stuff, and the bus boards and all of that. And But the key secret here for this video is how you order them in the right sequence. What do I mean? Well, if you want to do an OEM build out on some HP chassis, like the, three, uh, like the 385 or the 380, uh, or you want to do a Dell chassis or an IBM chassis, you have to identify up. A parts ID listing. Now, what that means basically is if you buy an empty case of a DL380, right? That's what it is. It's a piece of metal that can fit in a rack. That's it. Nothing else. Now, if you then want to go ahead and order the, the components for it, you want to order them in a sequence so that as they come in, they're based on the parts that have the greatest warranty return policy versus the parts that don't. What do I mean? Well, usually when you get a motherboard, you get a 30-day window to be able to return it if there's something wrong with it, right? With a, um, a RAID card or an adapter card or a small daughter card, sometimes they'll only give you a 14-day window, two-week period for returning the item if it's defective. Some will offer immediate swap outs. Some will offer an exchange and so on. So what you do is you have to put them all out there Let's say you use eBay, but there are other sources you can use. You put them all out there and you line up your greatest warranties to your least warranties. So you want to basically get the things that give you the longest life cycle, specifically the motherboard and the bus board. That's the board that connects all the hard drives in the front to the motherboard. Uh, you want those 30 days for sure. And then everything else has shorter windows. So uh, you do what I do is you'll get the bus board and the, and the motherboard CPU and RAM, because you need a post-it, 
right? You need to make sure it's coming up, it's reporting correctly, it's working right. CMOS chat, uh, chipset is working correctly, blah, 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 blah. Uh, you bring those up, you confirm that they're good to go, and then you've got your other parts coming in right after that. And so you are putting those parts in in sequence based on their availability and warranty. If you've come across a part that's defunct or not working right or you know there seems to be something wrong with it, return it. Get another one. Uh, it's the right thing to do and you've got it covered and you're not losing any money. Now when that comes in and you've got everything, what you're going to discover is like for instance with the Dell R730DX, a $12,000 chassis if fully populated, uh, you've spent six seven hundred bucks to get that twelve thousand dollar equivalency that is a bargain but when you pick the hardware you want to build out for your OEM chassis make sure you do one of the crucial little detail before you buy a single thing get a piece of paper out I'm sure everybody has heard me say this yes a technical specialist is telling you to get a piece of paper out because a piece of paper doesn't require power right Write down what you really want to do. When you're getting these components, like for instance, an R730 can be strictly a NAS head, or it could be a NAS head and a VM head, or it could be a NAS head, a VM head, an NFS repository, or it could be a media-based system as well. Why do I say this? Because there are different parts for different roles. You see, the processors is a good example. If you're going to do strictly a NAS, then two 8-way processor Xeon stacks are perfect, like a 6440, or I'm sorry, a, 20, a 2640 V4 processor stack. Two of those will give you plenty of processors, and it'll handle all the storage you can have, plus maybe one or two good VMs. But if you go to the, to the higher level stacks, like the 90 series processors, you can do everything NAS. You can also do 15 to 20 VMs. And you could run a media service, if you want, or two. Even, in that, in a, even an NFS or an EFS head, if you want to call it that. A replication sync head with AWS and EFS. Um, it's a, a real home server. So those pieces that you order, your processors, your PCI cards, uh, slots, riser card slots. Uh, you can get the basic ones that have no power outputs. So you can't put compute power in there, like a, a GPU. You could put two GPUs in a 730 if you did it right. Um, and these are the things that you know come back and come back to you to try to address so that you can get the right kind of hardware that you're going to put into it the first time. So design what you want first. Order the parts you need to meet it, and then order them in the proper sequence to get you in a good place with the chassis. Now. With that comes another question, and I've done videos on this already as well, but I'll just spin these out real quick for you. Make sure that you design your boot process. What do I mean by that? Well, make sure that you're designing your boot process so you can do NVMe if you need for performance. And NVMe is basically a very thin, small hard drive that we use, and it's staggeringly well performing. But you will have a limitation with that. NVMe can only do a couple, at a, at a, I wouldn't do any more than four on, a, on a, a PCIe card because they really do ride the PCI bus heavily. Um, there are a lot of people out there who, pro, who claim they can do 16 NVMe's, but they're not. What they're doing is they're, they're degrading the performance of the NVMe's because the bus just can't take it. So stay within the limits of your system and understand what you want to do. You can always, of course, use SSD hard drives as well. Those are good too. They fit in the two and a half inch bays and they do everything that you want. You know, this is a bay for the, for the 730 and they're very thin compared to the thickness of a spinning hard drive. And or you can do spinning hard drive. Why? Because you can get them for t five bucks a pop and they can give you your space that you need. That's the beauty of, of making sure you've got the best compatibility out there and why I picked the R730 as my next chassis. So, with that being said, all in all, this did not cost me much to make. 148 bucks without memory. I already own the hard drives and I've got the caddies. So, um, not a bad deal, right? 
Not everybody's going to find a hundred or two hundred dollar deal like that. And of course, with more 730 box uh, videos going out talking about it, that might up the price a little. But trust me, it was fun. It was fun to do. It was enjoyable, and I'm going to be able to do like 10 or 15 more videos off this chassis alone to co-integrate it with the 10 gigabit interfaces and all of that wild, crazy stuff. And also, you know, integrate with all the other gear that is out there, which is quite a headache sometimes. But uh, with that being said, um, if you have any questions about, you know, the pathways, I do do buy, I do buy some stuff brand new. Uh, usually those would be the actual boot devices I choose to boot uh, the, the system because I want them to have the newest life possible. Unlike raid groups, uh, boot drives, um, you know, if they're old, they can they can generate some problems for you. And uh, eventually, it's not if, it's when those devices will start to fail. So what you do is you go out and you buy yourself new equipment for that requirement to make sure you're giving the maximum longevity to your server as you're working with it. Why? Because um, unlike your RAID 5 groups, which you can rebuild from your backups, your boot drive, it should be the one thing it doesn't give you any grief, right? This leaves, lastly, the one other component that I recommend. There are different platforms out there designed to stress test, and you can get them on CD or you can get them on USB sticks, and um, stressing your hardware to make sure your hardware is going to do what it does. It, it ramps up airflow correctly when it gets warm, and uh, it, you know the metrics are planning are playing out correctly. Um, I suggest that you use what's called a CLI boot diagnostic for RAM and CPU stress levels because they do have the ability to stress a work a processor stack better than a GUI type uh, stress tool like Windows. Because frankly, you don't put Windows on a 730. No offense, but you just can't get the full advantage of 256 gigs of RAM and you know Xeon you know platforms. Um, it, you, there's a lot of headache to try to get a Windows box to do those things because they're so heavily geared for one to two processors that are like the i7s and the i9s. So I recommend that you flip over to a Linux CLI diagnostic tool that will sit there and stress test everything fully. I mean, it goes all the way to the maximum level of RAM you got and finds all your processors and your, math, and your uh, hyper threads and everything and just beats the heck out of them. You can go out there and stress test your 12 gigabit bandwidth pipes, which is what the 730 has. And absolutely, that's a big reason why I'm doing this. Because I just want things to run a little faster, a little bit smoother, and so on. And um, even if I'm using SSD drives, which would max them out and would completely max out the bus of the interfaces, it's still not enough. You know, it's you got to have a bigger pipe. And uh, that's nothing new, and that's cool. And my 720s will become. Uh, powerhouse Proxmox plat platforms for mega uh, <laughs> test bedding for me as I want to work with that because as you can see here in the background right there are my Proxmox uh, mini boxes in my pies and their storage capacity and working with this to get everything to a really good place um, for this coming spring and, and summer testing that I'm going to be doing uh, because the reality of the fact is software is catching up to hardware and software is not an easy beast to master. So make sure your hardware is solid, tested well, and everything you need is there and a little extra. Never hurts. Well, this is Brad Dyke. I hope this helped you some. Um, buying equipment is a kind of hit and miss strategy. So buy low, buy smart by having warranties uh, for our exchange. And then when you get the equipment, don't delay. Start testing it all out to make sure it's working. That's my next goal is to get some PDUs in here uh, that, are, that are newer ones than the ones I have now, just to make sure everything's working correctly with the 750s versus the 650s and uh, get, you know, get my system tweaked out because you don't need the power till you need the power. And it does happen. It's rare. And when you don't have the power, your CPUs step down. And then everything kind of craps out on you. So it's important to make sure you get all the right components and the components that can give you that extra punch. 
This is Brad Dyke. God bless and have a great weekend. Take care.